Nice. Yes. Dude, come on. Come on, everyone's cheering for you. Send it. Yep, that's me hunting off my project for the tenth time. This single problem has so many teachable moments, so today I'm pretty excited to cover the physics, the techniques, and the tactics that you can learn from this and apply to your own climbing. By the end of this video, we'll be maxing out these stats in completely unique ways, so I really hope you'll watch the whole thing. I work really hard to put out anti-superficial content, so if you liked anything in here, subscribing, doing the bell thing, smashing that like button, or leaving a comment would mean so much to me. Thanks, and I hope you enjoy. As usual, try to guess the grade and I'll reveal it at the end. This climb is all about power endurance. Super aesthetic, 24 relentless moves straight up the middle of the cave area called the Buddha. There's no good stances for recovery and nowhere to find solace from the bottomless physical and emotional ass kicking that you signed up for. A technical low start, mostly involving shifting your weight, opens up into the roof with bigger holds and even bigger throws. Now you're thinking to conserve as much energy as you can. Knowing that there's still half the climb left, try to keep it together as you make your way out of the roof and onto the headwall. Now, the battle really begins. After establishing on the last decent hold, journey into a sea of small crimps. By now, feels like there's acid in your veins. For long climbs, the mental fatigue from keeping focus starts to add up. A deadly combination when you need to be precise, stabbing for each next hold. Once your tank is running low, it's harder to maintain form and body tension. The elbows start coming out, the legs start shaking, it's just not a pretty picture. Somehow still holding on, heart pounding, just one last move to the finishing jug. The climb ends right below the top of the wall, but I think once there, you're obligated to push through the mantle, crest over, and survey the scene of your victory. All right, we're diving right in. The start is on a tenuous sloper and you move off of it at a bad angle. Typically for sloper holds, you wanna keep your center of gravity pressed in and beneath the hold. You're stable here, but let's move into the next stable position here. This would be your new center of gravity. Compare this to the previous position and that center of gravity. Maybe the most efficient way to move is to directly translate your body's center of gravity the shortest distance between the two points. Let's try it. Uh, okay, what happened here? If you remember from my first video, your body needs to go through a story from beginning to end. Take a look at your center of gravity during a successful attempt. Your body's path almost mimics the geometry of the wall. Staying close to the wall allows your body to maintain control of the starting holds for as long as possible before committing into the next move. The start probably looks trivial, but I've seen climbers far stronger than me punt off because their weight was in the wrong position. I swear that's not a flex. My point is you can have Alex Magos' finger strength, but it's still a tragic waste if you don't know what to do with it. Nothing to do with all of your strength. <laughs> so first tactic. If you find yourself on a low percentage move, keep tight to the wall and try to remain in control for as long as possible before committing into the next move. The shortest path between two moves isn't necessarily the best. Listen to the story your body needs to take. And first technique. The best way to hold slopers is to engage your center of gravity beneath or even tucked in underneath the hold. All right, I know we're still on the first move, but one last thing. Generally speaking, you can approximate the force and angle of your pulling by an arrow on your forearm. In physics, these arrows are called vectors. 
It's a mathematical term, a quantity represented by an arrow with both direction and magnitude. You can break a vector down however you want by laying smaller component vectors head to tail. So long as the final start and end are the same, the resultant vector is equivalent. Okay, we're about to apply this, but congrats, you just learned vector addition. Typically, every hold will have a dominant plane. I'm gonna break down the pulling vector into two components, one perpendicular to the plane and one parallel. So remember, because these components start and end at the same spots as your pulling vector, they're equivalent representations of the pulling that you're doing. Only the perpendicular component is the portion of your pulling power that's connecting you to the rock. I'm gonna move the parallel component here for a sec. This portion of your pulling vector, you can even visibly see is sliding you off the rock. If your arm angle approaches the angle of the plane, check out how little of your pulling power is actually helping you connect to the rock. Once your pulling angle is completely parallel, then the inevitable happens. So the next technique. The most efficient way to pull is perpendicular to the dominant plane. This applies to a vast array of hold types. For the next move, you're stabilized by a heel hook. This is a passive heel hook, meaning it's only holding your body in place instead of pulling your body up. I talk about active heel hooks in my first video, so take a look if you'd like. For these heel hooks, you're relying on the friction between your heel rubber and the hold, so you still need to press down. For friction-dependent heels, imagine dragging a piece of paper with your heel towards your butt, and point your toes away to help engage your calves. These are the body cues that'll help you perform your heel hooks better. Try this exercise with heavier books to get a feel for the friction. For this next part, count the number of hand movements and foot movements that you make. As you slowly get the climb wired, you'll learn to skip a few moves and still arrive at the same position. Following this path involves bigger moves and taps more into your max power. So the question is, is it worth it? Well, here's the next tactic. Look at the boulder as a whole. If you know that this is an endurance-based climb without too many stopper moves, then it might make sense to tap more into your max strength if that means saving you a few moves and your endurance for later on. So another heel hook was used here. You can place it down normally like so. The amount of force you're pulling down with is directly transferred into the rock. In engineering, this is called a cantilever. There's a better option here though, and that's to cam your foot with your heel below and your toe above. Now in addition to your original pulling force, if you twist your toe up towards the rock, it generates an additional amplified pulling force at your heel. This is called class one leverage. Heel hooking applies a lot of pressure on your knees. My returning viewers know what's up, but for all you newcomers, it's once again time for the heel hook warm up session. Getting to the end of the roof involves a split that would make the Rockettes blush. Now I'm not a flexible cat at the best of times. Oh my leg! This is the worst pain ever! Go, go, ah! But 9 times out of 10, it's better to maintain body tension and keep at least one foot on the rock. I skipped this part earlier in the climb as well, where instead of losing your feet, you sacrifice a bit of extra body tension to keep your feet from swinging. Maintaining body tension can be uncomfortable, but it helps to alleviate just that much load off your arms, your most limiting resource. Once you're on the headwall, you face down the crux of the climb, trying to get to that crimp. Oh, right. Uh, I can't show you that move because I've actually never been able to do it. How I ended up solving this climb was to do an extra four moves just to get to the same spot. 
So next tactic. Sometimes a certain move just might not work for you. On top of that, the majority of root setters are average height, strength specialized males. There's a non-zero chance the intended solution does not suit your body demographic. So don't be afraid to climb your own style. Even if that means more moves or more effort, if that's what gets you to the top, then lean in. Okay, look at the two-step process of this move. There's a quick match before you move your hand up. The alternative is to pull through in one fell movement. In a pull through, your peak effort spikes in the middle of the move. Sometimes it's unnecessary to exert force to that peak if you could sneak in a quick match before moving on. I see a lot of beginners overlook this. You don't always have to move hand over hand. Sometimes a quick match kicks down your level of effort and improves your chances to complete the move. This sounds unorthodox, but you can even match on your own hand if there's no room on the hold. It seriously works. I mean, I can't do a one-arm pull-up, but I can do a matching one-arm pull-up. For the home stretch of this video, we're going to cover what seems to be the buzzword of the season. The dead point. 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 The dead point is an explosive movement where you move dynamically from one stance to the next. It's important to learn this for moves that you generally can't reach from a static position. First is the windup. Think of your legs acting as springs. The deeper you compress a spring, the greater oppositional potential energy accumulates. This phenomenon is called Hooke's Law. This oppositional force is what propels you upwards and what comes next, the release. At the top of your movement upon release, there will be a feeling of weightlessness. This feeling can be explained by projectile kinematics. I'ma save it for a future episode, cause it's a bit more in depth than necessary here. In simpler terms, anything thrown in the air follows a parabolic trajectory. At the apex, there's no acceleration on this object, colloquially referred to as zero G. Your goal is to land your next move when your center of gravity hits this apex. Landing your move at zero G means your body has to calibrate the least to adjust for your new stance. So here's the last technique. For moves at the end of your reach, wind up in the opposite direction and then dead point to it. It's actually counterproductive to lock your body as close as you can to make that move. There are two topics I skipped over in this video. One is the management of your rotational equilibrium and the other is the bicycle maneuver. In the future, I'm gonna figure out how to touch on topics that I've previously covered. But until then, I think you'd really enjoy my last video that gets pretty academic on these two things. All right, you might have already seen the grade because I've been too exhausted to mask it out. But here's the reveal anyway, V8. This was a dense video, so kudos if you made it this far. This one took about two months and a lot of intense hours to make. I'm really trying to get this channel off the ground, so if this helped you in any way, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, or share with someone you love. It would really help keep me motivated. Once again, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.